Hello and welcome to the channel. I'm your host D-Day and today I'll be bringing you episode six of A Day with D-Day. And today's episode is going to cover years 2002 to 2006, which to me is a very important period of my life. I went through a lot of major development uh, in these four years, a lot of growing up. And uh, I learned who was not a soulmate. And I was introduced to another possible soulmate. So another maybe came into my life. So again, I need to stress that this series is about me and only me. Uh, I don't want it to be negatively applied to other people. This is a vlog. Uh, it's meant to chronicle my journey. So uh, I, this series will also not be for children. I'm going to, I'm planning on keeping this as unedited and raw. So if I make mistakes, you know, I am not going to constantly delete my files and restart my videos because I have noticed in the past that the more I do that, the less genuine my videos become. So uh, I'm not going to delete them. They're going to be unedited and raw. And by raw, I mean uh, I might cuss and I might show emotions if I... Uh, talk about something that I still feel something about. So if, uh, if you have a problem with profanity or with emotionally charged topics, this might not be the series for you, but the next upload that I have planned is going to be the teaser for Farming Valley. So that one should, you know, change the pace and bring some Minecraft. Uh, and also a little teaser, I think I have a microphone in mind that I'm going to get. <clears throat> so my primary goal with this video and with the upcoming series is to promote awareness, you know, uh, awareness of oneself and to promote kindness and understanding and acceptance. And also for me to have an opportunity to express gratitude. That is very important to me. And so I really hope, you know, that this video in the series, it does benefit you as well, not just entertaining, but hopefully I can spread some of my healing around. So if you could show your support, please hit the like button. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, hit the bell to be notified for future uploads. And also, uh, if you want to, leave some comments. I urge you to leave comments because I uh, get the notifications from YouTube on my phone and I love talking to people. And I love talking to people that care. It's important to me, so I will respond to all comments. And to be fully transparent, yes, uh, likes, comments, shares, subscribes, all of that. It does tell YouTube that the video is interesting, the YouTube algorithm, and it might get uh, pushed around, you know, to more visibility so more people can watch the video and find the channel. Because discoverability really is the thing that holds this channel back. Our channel holds our channel back from really blowing up and succeeding, it's visibility. So, if you are ready, then here is A Day with D-Day, episode six. So this episode, like I said, I'm gonna cover 2002 to 2006. These are the first four years out of college for me. And to me, I would argue that this is the most important chapter in my life from the lessons that I learned. Uh, so what I talked about last time is that my high school sweetheart, my girlfriend, uh, A, the letter A, she just broke up with me pretty savagely and I blamed myself for it. You know, even though she broke up with me, I blamed myself because I did cheat on her. I thought we were, we made it through it, but I was wrong. And I accepted that it was that 
Ultimately, I believed it was my fault that the relationship ended. And I got it stuck in my head that I lost my soulmate and my opportunity to be with my soulmate because she had to be my high school sweetheart. And I was still hanging out with both of my guy friends, R and N. And R ended up enlisting in uh, the military. So I ended up not seeing him that often from this point on. He would come down whenever he was on leave and we would hang out and do our usual thing, drinking and anime and just overall having a good time together. And uh, I, I was working at Game Crazy selling video games, which honestly the job was an absolute joke. That's why the company does not exist anymore today. <laughs> Uh, I barely had to do anything at all. Most of the time, no customers came into the store. I had my feet up. I had my wave bird from the GameCube in my hand, and I played my copy of Animal Crossing on the big TV in the corner. And back then, we had memory cards, so uh, I would spend my shift playing Animal Crossing and then clock out and go home and plug my memory card in and continue to play Animal Crossing. <laughs> So uh, I actually preferred being at work because I was getting paid to do the same thing I was going to do anyways. It's, it was pretty bad. It's pretty awesome, pr pretty bad for a company. So I was also hanging out with N more during this time because uh, R was gone. You know, he enlisted and N actually lived pretty close to the game crazy that I was working at. Uh, but I did not realize that his negative attitude it was really starting to seep into me and change me as a person. And I started feeling very unhappy with everything and everyone that was going on. And he was still complaining about that one girl that he talked to, that he dated for one week back in high school, that no longer talks to him. That was the, the biggest thing that he always brought up and he always pulled the forever alone card, you know, like super emo, that he's gonna die alone. <laughs> and I guess I kind of understood, you know, because I just lost who I thought was my soulmate, you know, and you know, we all like to say misery loves company. And I kind of felt like, I kind of felt bad for him, you know, I felt like I was the the alpha in that friendship and I had to take care of him, you know? Uh, but during this period, I still, I enrolled in community college, like I said I was going to do, and I started going to classes <clears throat> and uh, I realized that I was taking the exact same classes that I've been taking my entire life. I, I was taking them over again. And then, this is pretty embarrassing, I found out that I was supposed to go out of my way after getting my A in my AP classes. I was supposed to go out of my way to a different location and take an AP test. And if I passed that test, which I would have, I would have gotten college credit and I wouldn't have had to take the class in college. Like I could have skipped it. And I didn't know that. <clears throat> and I am still to this day completely shocked that no one ever told me that I'd never found out that this was what I was supposed to do. But I felt so completely ridiculous and defeated. I lost my soulmate and I just found out that I took the hardest classes in high school for absolutely no reason. <laughs> So I started doing uh, my college classes. I started doing the classes over again. And in college, these classes were harder. So I couldn't concentrate at all. All I could think about was, you know, A, my soulmate that I lost, and I couldn't concentrate in school. And I would get a bad grade and it would, it would hit me like a ton of bricks, you know, and Eventually, I wouldn't be able to get out of my car anymore from that, as soon as I got some bad grades or some bad news, like I was done already. And this happened for the entire four year period. 
So for the entire four years, uh, every semester I enrolled in four classes because I needed to show my parents that I was going to college. So every semester I enrolled in four classes, full-time student, I got a bad grade, and then I would sit in my car for the rest of the semester. I would drive to class every day and I would sit in my car because I could not bring myself to get out of the car anymore. And I did that for four years, <laughs> for four years. At the end of the semester, I would either get it withdrawn, I'd get a W, or something would happen and I wouldn't be allowed to and I would get an F. So it was pretty bad. So for four years, you know, every semester I took four classes and W and F. It was, it was pretty bad. And I was never able to like tell my parents because I did not want to, I didn't, I, I was, I was scared, you know? Um, so yeah, at the time, uh, I was also, uh, going back to my high school and hiding there more or less. I kept going back to my high school, my old high school. Well, the, the new one that, that was newly built. And I would play Diablo 2 in the library, the same thing that I was doing junior and senior year. I continued doing that even after I graduated high school. And one day, uh, I went in to the library like I always did. <clears throat> and a short, strawberry blonde girl, she came right up to me, walked a straight line right up to me and goes, I don't know you, who are you? <laughs> but like super curious, you know, not threatening at all. She was curious, who are you? And uh, her name will be Kay. And I was completely confused by her because she acted, she did not act like the, the, the normal girl that I've been dealing with up until this point. She, I could not understand her. That's, she was just that unique, I could say. And uh, every time I came to the library, I played Diablo 2 and sometimes, you know, she would walk right up to me. She would sit down next to me and she would just ask me questions. She wanted to know everything about me. And uh, she started pushing pretty hard to spend her off-campus lunch with me because uh, she found out like I lived right around the corner. <clears throat> so uh, I started, you know, picking her up for off-campus lunch and uh, I drove her from, from, the, from our high school to my home. And uh, yeah, like she pretty much sexually assaulted me every single time. She was definitely the dominant one. And uh, just to fully clarify, she was a senior and there was only two years difference between us at that time. And honestly, she absolutely rocked my world. She really did. And uh, I remember there was this one silly time. I dropped her back off at our high school and uh, she opened the door and I said, I don't think I can love again. Ooh, so emo. <laughs> but I remember, you know, at that age, when I said that, I meant it, you know, because I was still kind, I was still hung up on losing my soulmate or what I thought I lost my soulmate. So super emo D-Day, I don't think I can love again. And she looked right at me and she smiled, this goofy smile. And she said, I will make you love me. And uh, she leaned over and she gave me a peck on the cheek, a really fast one, a really weird smile smirk. And then she jumped out of the car and slammed the door, you know? It's just, she was, she was absolutely an enigma to me. I, I could not understand her. I could not figure her out. It's like only half of her existed in this reality and the other half was somewhere wonderful, absolutely wonderful. But yeah, uh, shortly after, you know, we, we started getting together, she was definitely my girlfriend at the time. Uh, her parents found out that I was visiting the high school and uh, 
they asked the school to ban me and then the, the school banned me from being able to step foot on campus, which uh, I completely understand, you know. I completely understand why and I completely understand because, uh, I mean, I can take the father's point of view, you know, like I would do that too, you know, so I understood. And I didn't see Kay again for a very long time, <clears throat> or I wouldn't say a very long time, but uh, like I felt something real for Kay, something real, I felt something, but I was completely distracted at the time, you know, because I was thinking about A, my high school sweetheart, my soulmate, and uh, my guy friend, my guy friend N, he just continued being negative over and over again. And whenever my, uh, my, my best friend R would come down to visit, I don't know if you guys can hear the siren outside, that sucks. But uh, it's about time this, this guy passes, right? Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, again, unedited. So yeah, whenever my uh, my best friend R came down to visit, uh, I started complaining to him because N complaining to me just filled me with this, like I needed to complain. So I started complaining to R about everything. And uh, R actually started lying to me about when he was in town and visiting. And when I found out, I got super angry at him and I stopped talking to him. That was my reason why, because he, he was lying to me about when he was coming down to visit. And uh, that's a really stupid reason to end a friendship. You know, that was that important to me. But uh, at that point, I started considering N, my best guy friend, and uh, I didn't realize, I really didn't realize at the time that he was subtly isolating me from everyone that I cared about. He really was. And uh, I didn't, I absolutely didn't realize at the time that I was taking the easy way out and I was letting him think for me. That's, that's what I realized, but of course, way too late. Uh, super cool. This is this is one of the big bullet points that I'm excited to share with you guys. In 2004, I went to a Buddhist fortune teller. Uh, I don't really know if fortune teller is the right word. Prophet, spiritual guide, uh, medium, whatever you want to call it, right? And his name was Chow Chin. And I feel I can say his name because he is running a business, you know, so... I went there at 2 a.m. in the morning to get in line, and I wasn't seen until 4 p.m. that same day. And his line, they it formed every day, really early, like midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. The line would form at uh, that time, and only the first 100 people would end up being seen by him because he, there's not enough time in the day to see more than 100 people. So uh, everyone showed up 2 a.m. They tagged the first 100 people. Everybody else had to try again another day, you know, and I ended up sitting there on that sidewalk from 2 a.m. to 4 p.m. until my turn. And, uh, you know, he was completely free. He did accept donations uh, because he did want to open up his own uh, or build his own Buddhist temple which I thought was pretty noble. And uh, I went into it, you know, to get my fortune told, you know, because I needed, I needed guidance. And I'm also a skeptic at heart, you know, so I kind of listened with a partially open heart, you know. I wasn't going to believe everything he says, but I wanted to be open to it. And uh, when I sat down, he started flipping playing cards, regular playing cards, and he started saying things like, 
oh, in this and this year, you're going to have a happy life, you know, and he kept flipping cards really fast. And uh, he told me some things, and, and then at the end, he asked me questions like, okay, what, what, what specifically do you need help with? And I told him that I wanted to know everything about my soulmate. Everything that he could tell me, what her name was, what she looked like, when I was gonna meet her, anything he could tell me. So this is what he told me. And I, uh, I, I remembered more and more things and I wrote it down exactly what he told me. This is what he told me. He told me that in the summer, of 2006, I was going to meet Stephanie, my soulmate, and that she was blonde and she had a famous last name. That is direct quote, that in summer of 2006, my soulmate, I was gonna meet Stephanie and that she was blonde with a famous last name. <laughs> and then he also told me that my career was going to involve music and law, yeah? And that I was going to meet Britney Spears. I was like, mm-hmm, all right. <laughs> so I thought he was completely full of shit at the end there, right? But I took all of the soulmate information completely to heart, you know, and simply because I wanted it to be true. I needed some guidance. Some guidance, even if it's wrong or it might be wrong, still better than no guidance, you know? So I took that because I wanted it to be true. And I dropped a 20 into the donation box and on the way out, he stopped me. He said, wait, he paused. And then he said, the next time you visit, or the next time I visit my grandfather, that I should ask for his wallet. And I remember leaving pretty upset, you know, because uh, my grandfather had died recently. So that bothered me that he said that. And then, yeah, Kay, Kay came into my life again, you know, for like a week. And we physically connected because we had intense, intense chemistry. We really did. And then she would run off again. <laughs> and I was happy for her. I really was. And I did not ever, I did not ever feel anything negative towards her. And she did this very often. Uh, she would pop in for a week, we would have an amazing week together, and then she would vanish for a couple of months. <laughs> and I was happy with her. I was not upset at all. So fast forwarding, summer of 2006. So it came around and I started looking for Stephanie. Stephanie, where is she? Everywhere. I started looking for Stephanie. And I was, I was looking for blonde Stephanie with a famous last name. <laughs> and, you know, where is she? And it didn't happen. Of course not, right? <laughs> uh, but I did make a World of Warcraft character named Stephanie. <laughs> yeah, in the summer of 2006. And uh, this is pretty cool. In the fall of 2006, A, my high school girlfriend, you know, my high school sweetheart, she called me out of the blue. Yeah. And she invited me to come down to Baylor to spend the weekend with her. And I drove like 100 miles an hour to Baylor in my BMW that I had back then. And we spent the weekend together and I rocked her world. <laughs> yeah, and I remember she said, where did you learn these things? And I felt so absolutely proud, you know? I was like, I'm the best baby. <laughs> but yeah, oh man, A, my first girlfriend. You know, the girl that I lost my virginity to, my high school sweetheart. My soulmate, you know, I went home after spending the weekend with her, after rocking her world, and uh, she just stopped answering my phone calls. Yeah. And then one last time, she picked up the phone and she told me to stop calling her. Yeah. 
She told me that she just wanted to get laid. Yeah. And I could feel a piece of me break inside. I really did. You know, I was with her for two years, you know, and I held her in my heart for four more years. And she used me. It wasn't really that that bothered me. It wasn't really that I felt used. It's, you know, that she dropped me like a piece of trash a second time. That's what bothered me. You know, she, she betrayed me a second time. I was done. And I immediately at that point realized that she was not the one. She was a maybe this entire time and she is no. Turned into a no. And I realized that I spent the last four years in a complete fog. And right after that happened, I started having really bad night terrors, really bad night terrors. I had the same nightmare for years after this. And I remember the nightmares, yeah, were me walking into a bathroom and I would see a girl in the bathtub and she was hugging her knees, you know, to her chest. And the water was up high, you know, cause the, so the bathtub was full and I couldn't see her face. I never saw her face. Um, but I remember she had long blonde hair and uh, she was always crying. Yeah, and, and sometimes I would walk into the bathroom and I wouldn't see her in the bathtub. So I'd run up to the edge and see her underwater and I would grab her and try to pull her back up. And like right when I grabbed her and pulled her up, I would wake up screaming because of the night terror. I would wake up screaming. And, you know, thank God my, you know, I live with my parents and my parents know, they know me, they understand me. Uh, my parents didn't make me feel worse about my night terrors and I'm very grateful for that. But yeah, like I had that same nightmare for years. And uh, one, one day I decided that I was gonna try to do different things in the dream, you know, to see if I need to do something. Maybe it's some kind of a, un, a you know, hidden thing in my mind that I need to deal with, you know? So I remember I tried getting into the bathtub with her, with the girl in my dream. You know, I sat down behind her, I put my legs to the sides, and uh, I remember that I wouldn't wake up after making contact with her this time. And uh, she would lay back down on, she would lay back on me. I remember I could feel it. And, uh, I would put my arms around her and I put my chin down on her, you know, and she would start crying. And I, sorry, hold on. <laughs> and I remember she would start crying and I would hold her and I would wake up from that dream and I wasn't screaming anymore, I was, but I was crying. I would wake up crying. And I did that over and over and over again. I would get, I kept having the same nightmare and I kept getting in to the bathtub and she kept leaning back on me and I kept holding her and letting her cry. And uh, then the dreams, they stopped. They, they stopped after after a while of me doing that, you know? And you know, there's the, the realist, there's the psychologist in me that wants to say that it's me dealing with my own things, you know? But there's also my heart, the romantic in me that I remember back then at that age, I, I really did believe that that was Stephanie <laughs> and that we were connecting when I was sleeping. And uh, yeah, in 2006, 2006 was also the last time that I visited Germany. I have not been back to Germany since. 
And while I was there, my grandmother, she asked me if I wanted anything from my late grandfather. And I remembered uh, the last time I saw my grandfather, he was bedridden. He couldn't get out of bed anymore. And uh, it was right after I won the, 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 the Junior Olympics, I got the gold medal. And uh, I handed it to him in person. I wanted to give it to my grandfather. And he spoke in a dialect that was very hard for me to understand. And it made me very nervous when he spoke to me because most of the time I couldn't understand him. But I, I totally remember, <clears throat> I totally remember him saying, Ich bin stolz auf dich. And that was the first time in my entire life that I heard someone say that they were proud of me. And then, you know, he started asking my grandmother over and over and over again for his wallet, get my wallet, get my wallet. And my grandmother kept telling him that he didn't need to pay me for the medal. He didn't need to pay me for the medal. And I was, I was sad, you know, because uh, I thought that he was confused, you know, because he was close to death, you know, he was bedridden. And, uh, oh, it, it was actually, that was the Christmas that I came home and I cheated on A. <laughs> How funny. Yeah, that was, that was back then. But uh, I remember I, I left the medal there with my grandfather. And uh, when my grandmother asked me in 2006, I remembered what Chao Chin told me, you know, that I should ask for his wallet. So my grandmother, she got his wallet and she gave it to me and I opened it and there was no money inside that wallet. There was no money inside. There was only one thing inside of that wallet and it was a picture of me in my Taekwondo uniform. And I remembered that he was proud of me. And, you know, the romantic in me, you know, it, the romantic in me told me that he never wanted to give me money. You know, he wanted to show me the picture that was in his wallet. He wanted to show me that he was proud of me, you know? And of course, it, it battles inside of my head as well. You know, the realist in me, the realist in me says that, you know, my grandmother could have taken everything out of his wallet and put the picture in there herself, you know, way later after his death. And that my grandfather was confused and he did want to pay me for it, you know? But I can't prove either one of those as true at this point. So it's up for me, it's up to me to choose what I want my reality to be. You know, what? which one would you choose? You know, and I chose my heart that my grandfather was proud of me. That's what I chose. So I moved into the next chapter of my life after this, and I only had N, you know, as my, as my best guy friend at this point. And K, she was dropping in and out. So I wanted to thank R for being in my life. He was my best friend from 1999 to 2004. He introduced me to anime, and he introduced me to responsible drinking, you know, Crown and Coke. And I actually have a giant jar of Smirnoff Ice bottle caps because that was kind of a new drink back then, you know, and we filled up an entire jar full of Smirnoff Ice that we drank together when we were, when we were raving at the beach. <laughs> yeah. But I tried finding R online and I can't find him anywhere, you know, and that's okay. Uh, 
I wanted to say thank you, you know, to R and to the universe for letting me have such a wonderful friend. And I also wanted to say thank you to A, my high school girl, my high school girlfriend, my high school sweetheart. Uh, I realized that she was not my twin flame. She was not who I was looking for. And that she wasn't even a soulmate for me. Not even one of my possible soulmates. Uh, we weren't compatible at all. And uh, that should have been that, but my mind, you know, my mind, my ego, it got in the way. I got in my own way. And that's why I missed my opportunity with M. And I missed my, I missed my opportunity with K. So thank you to the universe for teaching me this lesson in truth. I at least have learned my lesson now. And thank you to my grandmother and my grandfather. You know, thank you. Thank you so much for being proud of me. So next episode, I'm going to cover 2006 to 2009. It's kind of a lull in my life, but uh, it's, it's me getting my life back on track, you know? Uh, but then at the end, getting completely derailed at the end by the two abusers in my life. So fun stuff ahead. There's a storm of brewing, right? <laughs> so thank you again for joining me today. This was episode six of A Day with D-Day. If you can leave a like, a, uh, you know, hit that thumbs up. If you can uh, subscribe to the channel, share with your friends, leave comments with, you know, tell me you know, if, if, if the series is working or not, tell me whatever you want, you know, I love to discuss it with you. And, uh, the, the quote that I have for you guys, the office quote is, don't be an idiot changed my life. Whenever I am faced with a problem, I ask myself, would an idiot do that? And then I do not do that thing. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you, and I'll see you soon.